Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. We really want girls to embody a sense of joy in the process of discovery. You don't have any other choice but to keep going. I am so excited and thankful for the residents of St. Louis who believe in the arts. Today on Spotlight, a group creating equitable representation of black women across all STEM fields. Plus, actor Jeff Bridges gives viewers a glimpse behind the camera with photographs he's taken through the years. And then connecting the Midwest and the Middle East with innovations to tackle climate smart agriculture. But first, how music, a poem, and a dog inspired a novel. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. When Silas House began writing the beautiful new coming of age novel that would become Lark Ascending, he hadn't yet listened to the soaring, stirring classical music piece that was inspired by the famous poem, The Lark Ascending. First time I heard it, I just, I was so deeply moved by it. And now I bet I've listened to it a thousand times and I'm still deeply moved every time that I hear it. The book is very much an odyssey story. It's a journey and so is the piece of music. The same could be said for House, who grew up in the mountains of Appalachia in Eastern Kentucky, where he learned the value of faith, family, and the loyalty of a good dog. He also learned how to thrive and survive in the natural outdoor world, skills that are put to the test when his main character, Lark, is forced to flee a ravaged and divided United States in the hopes of seeking refuge in Ireland, a country that also helped House begin to heal after he suffered a devastating personal loss. I had signed up to do this writer in residence thing at the University of Ireland at Galway, and it was too late to cancel it. And while I was there, I just sort of worked through a lot of that grief by walking as much as I could. And at one point on my walk, I was joined by this little dog who followed me for a couple of miles. And he was just such a comfort to me. And that was the first seed of this book. So I think latching on to those moments of beauty and wonder and hope carried me through my own grief. And I hope that readers feel that when they're reading the book. Tell me about this story. Who is Lark? The main image that comes to any reader of this book would be, you know, a, a young man and a dog walking across Ireland together. It's the whole book, really. Um, and the young man and the dog are both experiencing profound grief. They've both lost everything. Um, Lark has lost the love of his life. He's lost his parents. He's lost his country. At the same time that I was writing the book, I began to feel like I was losing my country. There, there was so much political upheaval and so much vitriol. Then the pandemic, and it just seemed like there was a global sense of grief. And I just tapped into that and wrote this book um, and sort of imagine if things got worse. But then I had to think, okay, I'm gonna create a world in which things get worse and Lark is moving through that, but he has to find the hope and the wonder and the beauty. It felt so personal. Uh, e even though I know every novel is for an author, it just felt like this extra level of intimacy. Yeah, I think, you know, having been through that profound grief, what I learned was, I mean, the thing that I that I kept saying was, well, you you know, you don't have any other choice but to keep going. You got to keep going, no matter how sad and how low you are. And so you have to find those things to keep you going. You know, for me, it's it's always been books and dogs and nature and walking. And, you know, so those are the things I wrote about. To find out about the area of Ireland he wrote about known as the Second Heaven, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. 
If you're a teacher and enjoy our one-on-one -on -one author interviews, you won't want to miss the St. Louis Teen Book Festival Educator Night, December 2nd at the St. Louis County Library, RSVP by emailing teenzone at slcl.org. I started Black Girls to STEM because I was really noticing a gap specifically in the region in gender equity as it related to STEM of Black girls that was really coming from public schools, inner city, St. Louis, and other majority African American districts. I am a research and development chemist by background education and training. As a child, Cynthia Chapel was strong in math and science but it was a chance encounter that gave her the confidence to see that talent as a potential career. I didn't actually meet a black woman in STEM until I was like a sophomore in high school and she was an engineer who worked for NASA. And so I think it was very much an impression of like, oh, okay, maybe I can do science. After getting her master's degree and working in the private sector, Cynthia forged a new path by creating Black Girls Do STEM. Black Girls Do STEM! The goal of Black Girls Do STEM is really like to get to a point where black women have equitable representation across all STEM fields. As much as we want to trigger curiosity in our young girls for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics and build their confidence in their STEM capabilities and their own skill sets, we want to take, again, that integrated approach, that multidisciplinary approach to make sure that kids understand like how career pathways and skills can track across so many different areas that they may or may not be interested in. Through workshops like this, middle school girls can see career possibilities and hear from mentors in various STEM fields. This session ends with a challenge project, build a levy design. Terry, you like whatever you have on your budget is what you're going to use. If you put water on cardboard, it's going to like not dissolve, but it's like not going to work. So if you put the popsicle sticks on it, and then put the tape around it, it might break. I don't know. So at Black Girls Choose Thin, we really want girls to embody a sense of joy in the process of discovery, right? Joy in the process of being challenged. And I feel like that's why I love being a scientist. Here, the girls learn life lessons like persistence and growth mentality. Yep, this is it. It helped at first. So when you write your results down, what could you use more of? It helps me solve problems. One experiment we did with balloons, it didn't work out the first time, so we had did it again. Black Girls Shoot STEM is really, truly a grassroots organization. We really move in and shape our programming and our offering based on what parents and students and community stakeholders are telling us they need. I want to design things when I get older, like buildings. The last class, we did 3D printing. And I like that because it's creative and I like to make different things out of different things. Once our girls exit our middle school strategy or our Saturday Academy, they sort of age automatically into our high school support services, which is math and science tutoring, as we advocate for them to take three years of math and science as high school students, ACT preparation, post-secondary planning focused on scholarship and college access, as well as direct to the workforce pathway. And so I think that's what we want the experience for girls in the program to be. Building real confidence in their critical thinking ability. Being okay with failing and starting over, like fail fast, get back up, let's rethink it. Uh, we do so much design and redesign, test and retest, because it, that, that's, the, that's the process of learning and that's how you sharpen your skills and sharpen your mind. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We're at the Sheldon Art Galleries and we're featuring five new exhibits for the fall. We have Jeff Bridges, Pictures, Angela Schaefer, Good Mother, Chris Scabato, The Painter's Language, Emmy Lingscheidt, To the Animals, and Savannah Calhoun and Lisa Sims, Learnet. So Jeff Bridges has been photographing for probably over 30 years on movie sets. And before he started acting, he was a photographer in high school. Really loved photography and music, did not want to go into acting. His father encouraged the acting and uh, Jeff kind of put aside photography for the time being 
until he was on the movie set King Kong, where he was a photographer in the movie. And handling the camera again made him want to photograph. So he didn't start really seriously photographing on movie sets until Starman. And there was an actress in the movie with him that suggested, why don't you start documenting the set? So he started photographing, and what he started from that movie and has continued on to every set he's been in is making a small booklet to hand out to the cast and crew. And he is still doing that to this day. I found out about Jeff Bridges' photography a number of years ago on a news program, and the work was just amazing with the use of a panoramic camera and using it for detailed images like the one behind me where you get this beautiful distortion in the photograph. And this is how he prefers using his camera, is for close-ups. We're really excited to have this work here because he's mostly shown in California and internationally, but never in the Midwest. So we're just really honored to have this work here. In addition to Jeff's photography, we're really pleased to show his ceramic work. It's the first time it's ever been exhibited, so we were able to get 10 of the little ceramic heads to feature in our exhibit. And they're very precious to him. He's given them to his family, and it means a lot to his family and to him. So it was rather difficult to actually get the work that we have for this exhibit, and we don't know when or if they will be exhibited again. In addition to Jeff Bridges' exhibit, we're also featuring four other exhibits throughout the galleries. Angela Schaefer is a recent MFA graduate from University of Missouri, and she's showing her thesis work called A Good Mother. The work consists of her relationship with her son and how she's raising her son to be a good man. So it shows the bond of mother and son and the struggles and the good, sweet, kind moments. Chris Scavato's work, The Painter's Language, features visits from the studio of Ed Bosha. He was a friend and mentor, and she's documented his space, but created a body of her own that showcases his materials in a landscape format. And then in our lower level, Emmy Lingscheit, To the Animals, is a body of work that focuses on ecology and our effects on it with climate change and pollution and how animals adapt to our damage that we're causing. And our final exhibit is Learnet by Savannah Calhoun and Lisa Sims. They're recent graduates from the University of Missouri. And the body of work focuses on how women are viewed online. We're really excited to be showing these five exhibits. And the artists range from a 30-year span to a very recent graduates. Um, and that's one of the most exciting things with outstanding work by each. The exhibits will run through January 21st, and you can find out more information on our website, thesheldon.org. HEC Media, bringing you culture and community. Find all of HEC's positive programming and award-winning content at hecmedia.org. 21 years ago, BioSTL was created to build an innovation economy in St. Louis, leveraging our strengths in human health and in plant science and agriculture. About Eight years ago, we launched a global effort called Global STL, recognizing that for us to be successful in innovation in St. Louis, we need to be globally connected. And we began to connect with innovation hubs around the world, starting with Israel. I wrote innovative and brave government innovation policy that made a difference. The startup nation, more innovation happening there than anywhere in the world outside of Silicon Valley. Strengths there are very closely connected to St. Louis's, including plant science. We think in St. Louis that we are a world leader in plant science and ag tech, and Israel also is indeed a world leader in plant science and ag tech, and we have a lot to offer each other. I've served in places, I've served in Africa, I saw the effect of food insecurity. It causes immigration, it causes wars over resources, and these are problems that no one country can deal with them by itself. These are global challenges. I would even dare to say that even the United States of America, really this incredible country, cannot solve it by itself. And we all believe that innovation has a role in solving those problems and making the world better. This event is focused on food security and climate smart agriculture. And then here we are today as a result of a lot of that work. Two years ago, the Abraham Accords were signed, opening up new relationships certainly bilateral for between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. 
and my friends in the Israel government introduced me to friends in the UAE government at the embassy in Washington. Cutting edge technology in-house. The Abraham Accords, which is the peace agreement between the UAE, uh, Israel, uh, Bahrain, uh, brokered by the United States. This all brings us closer to our objective where we get to exchange ideas, get to learn uh, about new technology and sectors that are important to us. And now here we are, and we have a trilateral event, the first of its kind in the United States, of the three countries coming together to solve important global challenges. By hosting the event here in St. Louis at the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, where we're able to show off some of the gems and strengths of St. Louis, we want to convey to the world that St. Louis is an indispensable partner in solving these important world challenges. Food security at the end of the day is national security. We're here to learn, we're here to import ideas, not just goods, even though that the UAE is the largest export market for US goods and services in the entire Middle East. This is a very important symposium for us. Missouri and St. Louis has been able to really become this powerhouse and establish itself as a hub for other people like us to come here and learn. Very important sector for the UAE, the agriculture, climate change. Lots of brain power, lots of brain power here today. And it only makes sense that we bring the greatest mind really from Israel, from the United Arab Emirates to St. Louis, brainstorm together on some of the most acute challenges that this world is facing, namely uh, food insecurity, climate challenges, and that's why it's a great and beautiful opportunity. To get a little more familiar with each of these companies. We've invited a set of innovators, entrepreneurs, startups. Bringing water to the world. You have startups uh, from the UAE, you have startups from Israel, you have startups from the US. Including innovators from St. Louis uh, that can help drive innovations and change that can solve some of these problems. So Barack, you're up first. Take it away. WaterGen mission is to make drinking water available to everybody in the world that doesn't have access. It's to create water from a third source, which is the air. First of all, it pulls the air in, it goes through filtration, then it goes into our genius technology, which is a heat exchange. That's where condensation occurs and water is created. Covercrest really truly is a climate smart seed technology. We are an example of how bringing science and capital together in an ecosystem can really create something very powerful. It's happening, it's actually happening. It's very fulfilling to know that people have come. We are looking at the really greatest minds, greatest centers, greatest resources that are put into addressing these exact issues. We are looking at Israel, we are looking at the United Arab Emirates, and we are looking at St. Louis. A landmark musical later on Spotlight. I was honored to sign Board Bill 66 into law to give our arts economy the support and the shot in the arm that it needed. We are here to celebrate an investment in the arts. 18 months ago, arts organizations and artists got together and made a request for 5% of the ARPA funds to be invested in the arts to help with our recovery from the pandemic. Mayor Jones and Alderman Gunther, Alderwoman Shamim Clark Hubbard and Alderwoman Davis responded to the call with $10.6 million in ARPA funds for the arts in St. Louis City. When the pandemic hit and basically the world shut down, we were in our homes. This had a significant impact on arts organizations and artists. And so the federal government responded with relief packages like the PPP loans, shuttered venues grants. And so our artists and arts organizations were able to benefit from that. Now we're kind of in the second phase of recovery where local response is really important. And so the city has an opportunity to invest in the arts through a direct allocation to RAC to help us continue to support our artists and arts organizations because we're still very much impacted. Many of our organizations are performing, but audiences haven't come back to pre-pandemic levels. And so getting money right now is really important because our national resources aren't available. 
We are going to make sure that artists and arts organizations in St. Louis City receive access to general operating grants, things that they need to keep the heat and the lights on, pay their employees, and also program grants. It could be for a mural, it could be for a performing arts show, an arts exhibit. So we're very grateful that RAC's history of giving is to both artists and arts organizations. Now the Luminary is one of our, what we call general operating support grantees, and they will be receiving ARPA funds as part of our revenue replacement grants. My name is James McAnally. I'm one of the founders of the Luminary, the space that we're in now, and then the current director of Counter Public, which is a public art exhibition that runs for three months every three years. The Regional Arts Commission is one of the lead partners. So in 2023, it will run for six mile length of Jefferson Avenue from Sugarloaf Mound to the Griot Museum of Black History. And it's really, again, one of those ways in which Regional Arts Commission support is about kind of enlivening our, our city's neighborhoods and streets. So this project, it connects 13 different neighborhoods, working from the kind of far south city to north city and telling the story of our city's history through art and culture. I am so excited and thankful for the residents of St. Louis who believe in the arts. This is a full circle moment for our community. Back in 1985, the residents voted for RAC to exist. And here we are 37 years later and our residents still believe in the work of RAC. RAC is committed to ensuring that all of the artists and arts organizations in our region get support and are able to thrive. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Who's your boy? I love you. On a recent Thursday night, in the theater at the Missouri History Museum. History repeated itself. When you're not at Grand and Grand Boy, where do you go? It's called Some of My Best Friends Are, just as it was when it was first produced in St. Louis 33 years ago. And just as it was then, this reunion performance was standing room only. I'll be there. It was supposed to run for two, maybe three weeks. And then it ran for three months. Is it true? At the time, it was billed as St. Louis's first gay and lesbian review for people of all preferences, staged counterintuitively in the basement of a South St. Louis church. Playwright Joan Lipkin, founder of that uppity theater company, conceived the piece, wrote and directed the scenes, and produced it with music and lyrics by Tom Clear. We started with cabaret tables, and we got so popular, we took them away and made seating. And I would see Joan every night fitting this chair in over here, and could you scoot over a little bit? I would love to do it. The 2022 reunion starred most of the original cast, performing a selection of the original material, including the song No Billing, which tells the true story of Joan Lipkin's struggle to find actors willing to appear in the show, advertisers other than gay-friendly businesses willing to appear in the program, and mainstream media willing to cover it. My mother would probably give up the ghost if she heard on the tube or read in the post. The then entertainment editor of the Post-Dispatch said to me, this is not appropriate for a family newspaper. And I said to him, you haven't seen it haven't seen it, you haven't read it. So how can you make a decision like that? And it infuriated me. Once it was clear the show was a phenomenon, the paper changed its position. Wow, <laughs> two mommies. The play, originally a sign of the times, is now more of a time capsule, opened for one night only at the History Museum. The reunion was meant to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the play, but had to be postponed three years because of COVID. Rehearsals were mostly done on Zoom. When Some of My Best Friends Are opened in 1989, it predated everything from marriage equality to don't ask, don't tell. It was, however, during the depths of the AIDS crisis and the 20th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion, credited with starting the LGBTQ plus civil rights movement. There was grief and 
illness and dying, and I thought, this can't be all of what our story is. It's like nutrition for us as gay folks that some of us don't get from family or community elsewhere. The way that they wrote the show, it was community building. That uppity theater company had a booth at the back of the theater to give activists a place to bring attention to their causes, among them a petition drive to overturn Missouri's sexual misconduct statute. It was eventually repealed, but only after the Supreme Court found such laws unconstitutional. And just as they did in 1989, LGBTQ plus groups set up tables at the reunion performance in the Grand Hall of the Missouri History Museum, which currently has an online exhibit called Gateway to Pride. A full gallery exhibit on local LGBTQ plus history will be opening in 2024. Women's relationships are different from men's. After we break up, we're still friends. After 33 years, when you still remember a piece of art, that's evidence that that piece of art had a fundamental impact. Rodney Wilson saw the play during its original run and went on to have a fundamental impact of his own. After finding himself the center of media attention when the then 29-year-old history teacher came out to his students, Wilson went on to found LGBTQ plus History Month, now celebrated across the United States and in 14 other countries. You know, we all nudge here a little, nudge there a little, and eventually all of those nudges produce a profound impact. Among those in the audience for this production was a current student of Rodney Wilson's, interviewed the next day by Wilson to get his reaction. In the best and worst ways, as much as things have changed, they stayed the same. And I think that is one of the great points of that show is that it stays relevant, but also we wish it wouldn't stay relevant. Gonna throw it up into congressional debate whenever I decide to accept a date. There is no one way of measuring how much has changed for the LGBTQ plus community over the past 33 years. But consider this. There's a judge in my bedroom. In 1989, Joan Lipkin says she had to beg the city to send extra police patrols to the theater for protection against potential hate-motivated attacks. There's a judge in my At this performance, the city sent a mayoral proclamation to the theater designating October 20th, 2022, as some of my best friends are day in the city of St. Louis. If we don't find ways that we get together, that we sit together in spaces and learn about each other's experiences and also enjoy each other, where are we going? This little thing that I wrote 33 years ago actually might not be a museum piece and it actually might be more relevant than ever. Next week, the art and fashion of Indian artisans at the St. Louis Art Museum, plus a company creating drinking water from air. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.